The Lord says, I speak expressly because of you. That even when you cannot see me, you can hear me and follow my voice and find peace. I speak for you that in the midst of the dark, you can find me. I speak for you that in the midst of the chaos, you know where to go. Father, we thank you because you have given your word and your word has healed us freely. And that word is Emmanuel. That word never leaves us nor forsakes us. Father, we thank you because we have the power that made all things by whom all things were made. That power, the power of your word, we have said, I would like for us to pray. And tonight's prayer begins with an instruction that I received of the Lord as the worship was in progress. The Lord Jesus said to me, and sometimes I want to be humble about the experiences that I have in him, but tonight will not be one of those. I say to you, the Lord appeared to me, and he said to me, tell them to find me. He says, because I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He says, just tell them to find me because when you feel lost and unsure of what to do, you just need to find Jesus. He is the way. He says, just tell them to find me. Now, I'm not telling you something that is theoretical. I am telling you what you can practically do because there is a beacon on the inside of every single one of us that was situated there by the lover of your soul and the maker of your being, essential for finding your way whenever you were lost. He put the beacon on the inside of you to find him all the time. And that is the reason why Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice. He put that beacon on the inside of you so that if you can calm down the noise in your thoughts if you can shut down the voice of doubt and if you can shut down all the negativity you can find his leading on the inside of you and he will lead you to the door because he is the door Jesus says find me he is the truth you know very well that certain things about your current situation are not what God says about you. Those things are not the truth about you. You do not even want to accept them because to accept them is to accept defeat. To accept them is to remain falling short of the glory. And so what do you do when you know that what you call reality is not consistent with the love of your heavenly father? You find Jesus because he is the truth. Find Jesus, he is the truth. And he says, I am the life. You know how many times we just feel lifeless, we feel discouraged, we feel empty, we feel like we have missed it. You know, there are times when thoughts come to your mind, ringing it in your ears, like the voice of Delilah, ringing in the ears of something that you must have missed it somewhere. The enemy comes and he plays that trick. He plays that trick upon our minds. Sometimes he's not even talking about your entire lifetime. He's, he's only talking about your day. Saying, you must have missed it somewhere. This day isn't going the way it should go. And you, and you buy into that narrative. I say to you today, whenever you feel like what you're hearing is casting you down, switch it around and begin to hear the voice of him who says to you, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Because he doesn't want to put you down. He wants to lift you up. And so this is the prayer. If you believe, would you raise your right hand with me? That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If you believe, and you want to be able to find him by seeing the beacon that is in you activated all over again. To see that beacon work as it should. Raise your hand and say, Lord, I am your sheep. You are the good shepherd. 
and I know your voice. In the midst of chaos, I know your voice. In the midst of every trial, I know your voice. No matter how hard it is, I know your voice. And I say to you today, in the mighty name of Jesus, be it unto you according to the profession of your faith. Give Jesus a big shout and be seated in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is good. Oh, I appreciate that. I figured so. Thank you. All righty. God is good. I know that we've got almost all of um, the McLean family out today, except for Papa. And um, we've got a couple of people out. And some of them, we know the reasons why. Some, we haven't received an update just yet. Uh, but whoever comes to your mind that you do not see tonight, I want you to go ahead and reach out to them, see how they're doing, you know, see how they are faring. I heard about Saturday night and how much of the fire of the Holy Spirit was experienced in here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, um, there are times wherein the Lord will get into our schedule just so that he can, so that we can enjoy the fulfillment of prophecy. How many people here on Tuesday remember that as I was about getting off the stage, I had even signaled to Alan to come and bless the offering when the Holy Spirit said to me, pray for this woman, but let everybody pray for her, for what I've got in her for them. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Y'all remember that? And I said, let nothing get in the way of you being a partaker of that. Of you being a partaker of that. And I said also that it is in particular an outpouring for the fulfillment of intercession. If you were not here, I strongly recommend that you go back online and listen to it because what the Lord revealed to me is that there are things that this woman by her dedication in the place of intercession has been able to secure for men and many who have yet to be able to tap into it because of a disparity in the frequencies of receiving and providing. And that is the reason why the Lord said specifically to stretch forth your hand. And so when I said that on Tuesday, the Lord already knew that there was no more time to waste. So when Saturday came, I was preparing to come in here and just do business as usual. But the Lord told me that this, the, the state of my being was a message to me, not one of those things that I would override. Because some of y'all who know me, you know that sometimes my body may be saying one thing, but I would always remind myself that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So sometimes I will attribute the signal of my flesh to uh, 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 what you would call an inhibition, and I will override it. And I was getting ready to do what I do to shake up the beast into the fire, and the Lord said to me, would you just rest today? I said, okay, I will not override, but I will rest and while I was there and you were here, I turned on the television and I decided to watch Tuesday's meeting because I hadn't made any time to watch it up until then. And the Lord said to me, while everyone was being blessed in that moment, you were my moderator. He says, you were my moderator because I needed someone to moderate that moment. He says, now it is your moment. Sit back and receive. So that which y'all did as you were stretched, as your hands were stretched toward her to pray, I began to receive mine in that very moment. You know, the Bible says, he that waters himself must be watered. And I can tell you that I believe that mountains have moved. Amen. Praise the Lord. So thank you, Lord, for the fulfillment of prophecy. Praise God. You know that that was only on Tuesday, right? And the next meeting... My wife had the opportunity to pour and to minister to us. As soon as I was done ministering and we all prayed for her, I looked at Z and I said to Z, you have been seeing things, but now you are operating 
on another level. You're about to begin to see more specific things about people that don't even require a confirmation from them because you will know that it is of the Lord and that it is clear. How many people remember that? Praise the Lord. When I finally caught up with her, or maybe, when was it, Sunday night? Or so, or Sunday afternoon sometime, when I finally caught up with her, what she had sent me that she saw concerning me while I was here on Tuesday could not have been any more specific than it was. Not only did she have a vision, a picture, she was even able to draw and create a diagram of a very complicated equipment that we have been planning to secure for our business. And I said to her, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. And I did say to her, I said, until I saw what you sent, I hadn't even told my wife about it. Even the people who work for us overseas don't even know. It was a plan between my brother and I, and we spoke in confidence because we were going to divert some resources that could make some people not be too happy. Because I was like, we need to acquire this equipment. And so I told my brother, I said, this is how this thing is going to happen. This is where the funds will come from, at least from the plan that we were making. And we need to acquire that equipment. We didn't even know that that particular one existed. We did some research and we found it. And we said, we, we will go for it. And that was what the Lord revealed to her, including the location that it was going to be situated at. When I was telling my brother, he was like, um, he says, slow down. Send me what you're saying. Because to him, it was almost as if I was just giving a recap of the meetings that we had had. I said, let me send this to you by the hand of a woman of God who had not been in any of our meetings, at least not in the body. What is the implication of all of what I am telling you? I was hoping that by now you would have gotten it, but I would help you a little bit to get it. What I am saying and what the Lord is saying to you is that we have come to a time wherein the fulfillment of prophecy has been expedited wherein these things have been said and they have been fulfilled. And if the Lord has to interrupt someone's schedule and someone's plans to make that which he has said concerning you come to pass, it will happen. People's flights will be delayed because of you. People's flights may be canceled because of you because someone that you need to encounter has to come and cross paths with you for the fulfillment of prophecy. And these are not things that take two or three months or two or three years or 10 years as they do, but now they are happening just in the very next appointment. You see, that is the spirit. The way you rose up to give thanks is the spirit of the hour. You know, I will continue with sharing with us. I just want to say to you that we had a delivery just yesterday. Diamond put to bed yesterday. And officially, I've changed her name now. She's no longer Diamond. She's called Zion now. Because the Bible says that as soon as Zion traveled, she brought forth. She told the husband, we cannot make it to that other hospital because I am about to bring forth. And as soon as they got to the hospital just nearby, she delivered. And while the worship was on, what I saw concerning you, ma'am, is that yours will be the same. And let me tell you something, I speak to you in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, and I stand upon holy ground so declare upon you that there is no war of the enemy that can impede the promise of God concerning you. The Lord has promised you rest and grace, and so shall it be. So let your spirit receive it and be confident in God, because it will be as the word of the Lord has come forth through his anointed. So just be rest assured that it is done in the mighty name of Jesus. So I come to you today in the power of Michael. I come to you today in the power of the one who is like God. The one whose words will remind you of the power of the almighty God. The one whose words will remind you of the magnificence of the grace of God. I come to you today in a grace that makes things happen and in the power that makes things easy. I come to you today in the mighty name of Jesus because the Lord has heard you and the Lord has heard the travail of those who have interceded on your behalf. And I declare over you today that you have come to your season of walking upon your high places. You have come to your season of milk and honey. You have come to the season of your feet 
bathed with milk. You have come to the season of the whiteness of teeth and the clearness of vision. You have come to that season that has been declared of old, but has come to make all things new. Better believe it. Better believe it because it is the testimony of the Lord Jesus. The Lord said to me, in what should have been just a casual, uh, you see, let me tell you something about the season that we're in. It is the season of the spirit. Forget about the flesh. We have come to the season of the spirit. When I say forget about the flesh, just let the flesh know that you have already put it in its place. So that when the spirit comes calling, you will follow the leading. Because there is so much goodness and so much treasure that is in the spirit for you in this season and you cannot afford to miss out on it just because of ego, just because of fam familiar spirits and just because of genes that run in your human blood. This is not the season of this is how we do it in my family. This is not the season of it is my nature. No, 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 no. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the season of the spirit. The Bible says that which is born of God does not sin. And your spirit is born of God, which means it can never miss the mark. And that is the reason why you need to be in the spirit so that you do not miss the mark. So I say to you again in the name of Jesus, forget the flesh this season. You just have to make that, you have to come to that awareness and that realization to know that things have changed. Because the Bible says there is nothing new under the heavens. That which is, Solomon said, is that which has been. And that which is to come is that which is. And so if you want things to change, you have to be of the mindset that things have changed. Because if you want it to be present, it must have been. So that's the reason why I want you to say Forget the flesh. Because things have changed. I'm going to say that slowly until everybody gets it. Or at least until more people get it. You see, when I tell you that there is nothing new, that what is, is what has been. If you don't grasp the insight and the revelation that things have already changed by you yourself having a shift in your consciousness, then there will be no change in your situation. You see, a change in your circumstance is only a reflection of that change in your stance. So you must know that you can no longer be who you are, taking cues from the flesh. Because whoever lives a life that takes cues from the flesh would live a life that is run by the forces of life rather than being run by the word of prophecy. Do you think your spirit can drown in water? This is not even theology as much as it is physics. You cannot drown spirit in water. Spirit is wind. Try and bury wind inside water. You see what will happen without any intervention. It will rise to the surface in a beautiful orchestra and it will come out and be free again. Because the Bible says the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there can never be bondage. There is only liberty. So if you know that your spirit cannot be drowned, then why are you afraid when you see the storm? <laughs> you see where the change begins? The change begins in that stance that you take in your spirit man. And the moment you're able to elevate yourself to the posture of an overcomer, then the current battles that you are in 
would have to just end simply because what is the point of the battle when you have already won? And the battle that the enemy is preparing to bring your way would have to be arranged for someone else because you have now become a waste of time to the kingdom of darkness. And that is the reason why it is important for you to recognize that you are born of God and that you are spirit. And because you are spirit, you cannot entertain fear because the things that men are afraid of are things that are alien to your spirit. Jesus said, as I am, so are you. People are afraid of death, but you are the resurrection and the life. Why would you join them? Jesus said, as I am, so are you. He says, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And so that means you are spirit and you are life because he spoke you forth. And so where would the fear come from? And why should it stick to you? The only reason why you're afraid is because you are flesh. So if you want to lose the anxiety and the fear, forget the flesh. I want to show us today. I want to share with us an insight that could have been a mundane experience but because of the fact that I put my flesh in its place and followed the leading of the Spirit, it became a glorious moment of instruction with the Lord that has brought me to this place which I know you also should be at. Now let me explain what I've just said. My flesh was suggesting that I go in one direction. And I saw the point that my flesh was making because there is something called ego. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of it. Maybe the women don't know what that is, but the men know very well what ego is. And so my flesh was like, oh, because you are this and that, you must not allow that to slide. You must not let this happen. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. But then sometimes some things, all they make is sense. They don't make progress. They don't make fruits. They don't make you. They just make sense. But what do you want to do with your life if all you have is just a couple of principles that make sense? We need to elevate beyond just being able to reason logically with the flesh because the flesh is very good at logic reasoning. And so while I was yet considering what the flesh was saying, the Holy Spirit said to me very sharply, and that is the mercy of God. You know, the mercy of God would allow for you to pay attention where you need to. And he said to me, he says, not this time. This time, I want you to follow my leading and follow it very closely. And a couple of hours later, I find myself taking a walk and the Lord was with me. You know those times when you know the Lord is with you, you're so confident and so conscious of it. Maybe not confident, but so conscious of it that you, can't, you don't even want to turn aside and look just in case you see him. You, you, I'm sure some people here have experienced that. And if you haven't, yours is coming because kind begets kind. You see, when you're so conscious of him being around and he showed certain things to me that I want to share with you. The Lord said to me, if I let us read the scripture behind this together, come with me to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians, if it sounds to you like Ephesians, it's okay because they just write close to each other, next to one another. Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to read verse 6. Now, I want, to, I want to encourage you to begin to look at the Word of God from the perspective of being the complete resource that you need spirit, soul, and body. So when you receive an instruction from the word of God, you need to know how to exactly apply that to your entire being, right? Because when you receive, when you read the word of God, you need to be able to apply 
the understanding of the word of God to your spirit in terms of the identity of who you are. Okay, your spirit needs to be reminded, you need to be reminded in your consciousness of who your spirit is, which is a child of God, an overcomer, one that is more than a conqueror. The, the power of God made manifest in an individual existence. That is what your spirit is. So when you read the word of God, you need to read the word of God being fully reminded of who you are in Christ. That is what your spirit needs. Your spirit needs an identity refresher when you read the word of God. But your soul needs something a little different. Your soul needs a cleansing whenever you read the word of God. Because the Bible says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So when you read things in the word of God, ask yourself, is this what I practice? Is this what I believe? Is this what I regard in my day-to-day -day life? Let your soul receive a cleansing. And then your flesh needs to receive a rebuke. Because the Bible says that to be carnally minded is enmity against God. And the carnal mi mind or man is always in enmity against God. And so when you see the word of God, it must hit your flesh because your flesh is always coming from the opposite direction to the word of God. Always. That's what the Bible says. Hardly would you find, if you find your flesh agreeing with the word of God, so now let me make a distinction for somebody here who may not have thought about it. Your flesh is not your body. This physical body is not your flesh. This physical body is a tool. It's a temple. Your flesh is the thinking that focuses mostly on survival. That carnal instinct that just wants to self-preserve any thought that comes to your mind that wants to take the place of God is what the flesh constitutes. When God says forgive, but you want to be in unforgiveness so you can punish the person to teach them a lesson, you're taking the place of God because he is the teacher. And the Bible says vengeance is mine. And so when I'm talking about your flesh, I'm not talking about your body. So don't go and be cutting yourself like some religions do to say that they're punishing their flesh. No, you're just wasting your time and impeding your own progress because you need this body. You understand what I mean? So let me give you an example. That is one of my favorite examples. Your body, this body does not need food every 30 minutes. It doesn't need food every day. This body on its own would rather not eat for three straight days regularly simply because that is how it is designed to function. It is designed to function by maximizing whatever comes into it without overload. You understand what I'm saying? Your body is designed to self-heal and to eliminate toxins. And so it, it processes food in such a way that the things that are easier to break down, it breaks them down quickly, uses them for energy, and it stores that energy to use for some more complicated stuff. And it needs time to get through its own schedule so that it eliminates all of what it takes in in order for you to remain vibrant. So that is this body. This body is an intelligent machine woven by God, but there is a consciousness in man that is called the carnal mind that tells you that if you don't eat, you will die. That if you don't take that coffee in the morning, you, morning, you will not be able to function. And so if you don't understand the difference between your flesh and your body, you find yourself not being able to fast because your carnal self just wants pleasure all the time. You understand what I mean? Your carnal self wants pleasure all the time. Your body doesn't. You find your body feeling better. I feel some of my very best on day four of no food. And people who fast regularly, you can attest to that. You feel your very best. You find energy coming from somewhere. Once you have been able to overcome the carnal mind that keeps you awake, especially day two, that carnal mind will begin to send frequencies of headaches. But in reality, if you have a machine to scan yourself, there's nothing wrong with your brain. It's just the flesh that wants food so desperately, it will lie to you. 
It will make you see things that are not there. You smell food that is not even being cooked. You can smell a piece of banana from the mailbox. Your body is not that clever, but your flesh is that cunning. Does it make sense? And so when you study the word of God, you need to know how to apply the word of God to your spirit, to your soul, and to put the carnal man in its place. The Lord help us. We have help. We have the Holy Ghost. So Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. It says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The Lord is speaking to your spirit man here. Equipping your spirit on how to deal with some of the challenges of the flesh. Things like anxiety. The Bible says be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And I used to think and I probably have taught along the lines of seeing those three forms of prayer, of three forms of engaging the supernatural as independent and different. Yes, they are different, but they are not particularly independent. They happen to be steps of the same progress activity. Which progress activity are we talking about? We're talking about the activity of being at peace at all times. It is your divine mandate by God to be at peace at all times because you are, you are in fact an ambassador of the kingdom of God. And so everywhere you go, everywhere you find yourself, in whatever dimension you are, your consciousness is in, you need to represent heaven. And the Bible says that heaven is what? Not what you eat, not what you drink. Heaven is righteousness, peace, and joy. So in your thoughts, you must be at peace at all times. In the natural which is when I say natural, the state that we're mostly conscious of, which is where you're sitting right now, you must always be at peace. And if you happen to be in a dream or in a vision or in a trance, you must also be at peace. Don't be freaking out in dreams. I say it again. I hope Kayla is taking notes. More like I hope we're taking notes from Kayla. Because she's lived it firsthand and she's seen that, you know what? Even the little excitement that I am showing is not particularly welcome here because these people are so peace loving. So I need to be able to comport myself as a civilized person if I find myself in a dream. Does that make sense? So thank you for sharing your experience with us because we are not more knowledgeable now because of you. So when you find yourself anywhere, you need to be what? An ambassador of peace. And that is why God is saying, I am telling you how to be at peace everywhere you go. And the only way to be at peace is to eliminate every strain of anxiety. Imagine what your life is going to be like if you are not worried about anything. I'm not talking about telling yourself, oh, I'm not worried about anything. No. But when we x-ray your heart, we know you are. You understand what I mean? Because there are certain times where you're just like, oh, I'm not. What you're saying or what we say most times is, I don't want to worry about anything. But the reality of it is that most times we are not completely void of worry. And the Lord has given us the blueprint, the secret to living without any anxiety at all. The Bible says, be anxious for Nothing. Let me use, let me further that Kayla example. In fact, I'm going to come back to it again because there is just so much nugget 
to draw from that experience. I'll mention this one real quick and then I'll elaborate on it later. You remember the, the, the experience that Kayla had wherein she was in a trance and she didn't know she was in a particular dimension where thoughts are actually words. And even though she, she was trying to compose herself and not open her mouth, her thoughts were being heard very loudly, right? <laughs> you see, time itself in some dimension is tangible and can be moved around. The way thoughts that you're thinking in your mind right now that you think nobody knows, in a particular dimension, that thought that you're not voicing out is, is loud. Everybody can hear it. If you can be conscious of that dimension, it's not a dimension that you visit, it's the dimension that you exist in because we're multidimensional beings. The fact that we're not conscious of it doesn't mean we're not there. The Bible says you are already seated with Christ Jesus at the right hand of the Father. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, but quite often we are not conscious of it. If someone asks you right now, what song are they singing in God's presence right now? You're like, uh, I don't know. But that's, what, that's where you are. The Bible says you are there all the time. You're not going anywhere. Do you know where else you exist in? You exist upon the palm of God. The Bible says he has engraven you upon the palm of his hands. That means you, you're never away from him. You are always with him and you're always in him. The Bible says in him you live, you move, and you have your being. But even though we're in all of these dimensions, we're not always conscious of these dimensions. And that's why the apostle Paul said to us, let your attention be on things that are above and not on things that are beneath because he knows that as human beings, we are tempted to be conscious only of the dense, of the material. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because of the fact that many of us, until we know how to quiet our minds in all of the many dimensions of power, we will still be finding ourselves lacking this and lacking that. Particularly things that make for your peace. So you need to learn how to quiet yourself and how to be able to be aware and conscious. But the point that I was making is whether you're conscious of those realms in the spirit or not, you exist in those realms. And time is an entity in some of those realms. I'm saying that again because of the fact that somebody needs to go to their own dimension of time and move things around. You see, let me give you a, a very practical example that most of us learned when we were children from the word of God. Mary went to Jesus when they were at the wedding at Cana and she said to Jesus, because she knows the son that God gave to her, even though he hadn't made himself known to the majority of the people, Jesus, the Mary knew Jesus was capable of all things. And so when they ran out of wine, Mary was like, I know you can do it. I've seen you do stuff. I've heard from the angel of the Lord that you are the Messiah. So what is wine that you cannot just make happen like that? And so she went to Jesus and said to Jesus, and the significance of that is that you and I, we are like Mary, we have heard of the goodness of God. We have read in scripture of the power of God. We know what God is capable of doing, but are we able to get him to do it? So Mary went to Jesus and said, Jesus, they've run out of wine. And Jesus was like, what have I to do with you, woman? That is like saying, can you please leave me alone? Do you not feel like that sometimes when you're bothering God about certain things and it feels like God is telling you to not bother him? Because it's like, God, I've been talking to you about this thing forever. Why does it seem like you're looking the other way? What did Jesus say to Mary? Jesus says, what have I to do with you, woman? My time has not come. And Jesus was right. That time was yet to come in the initial dimension of engagement. 
When Mary engaged Jesus in that dimension, the time hadn't come. So what did she do? She went to a higher dimension. And in that higher dimension that she went to, time can be moved around because it's an object. You can pick it and put it on the table and put it on the chair. You can hold it. It's tangible. And she made that time come by going to the dimension of faith that has works. She wasn't there saying to Jesus, oh, come on, Jesus, I know you can do this. I know you can do it. No, she wasn't negotiating. She just said to the people, whatever he tells you, do it. Can I break that down to you a little bit? There is a dimension where you tell God things, but there is an, another dimension where God tells you things. <laughs> Jesus Mary was telling Jesus about the situation, but Jesus showed absolutely no interest. But you know what's interesting is there is a particular dimension that God is issuing out instructions and you are showing no interest. And two cannot walk together unless they are in agreement. And so the woman was like, if I am telling him to do it and he doesn't seem to be doing it, then what we need to do is we need to go to where we can do what he says and then he will do what we say. You know, I said this last week in a different way and I didn't plan to say it again today, but thank God it's coming forth because what the Lord is letting you know is that you can hop around from dimension to dimension to get things done. And you need to in a lot of cases. Because God knows that if he lets you experience a one-dimensional success, you will not venture into outer space. I'm not talking about the NASA kind of outer space. I'm talking about, I'm talking about you getting out of the space that you're familiar with. Get out from the mundane. You know, if all I do every time is just say, God, I need this and it makes it happen. How will I go and engage myself in the dimension where persistence is material? You know, from this realm, persistence is kind of like um, immaterial. You can't touch it. You can't hold it. But there is a dimension wherein persistence is like a garment. You can wear it and stay in that garment until you accomplish what you need. I'm going to keep saying these things. They're very, they sound scientific, but you need to get it because it is actually in the kingdom. From a kingdom perspective, they're very simple. Maybe another example will help you. When you sing, do you see your words? When you're praising God, do you see it? But do you know that there is a dimension wherein praise is a garment? Wherein when you're in that dimension... Praise is as tangible as a garment that you put on that until you take it off, you won't stop praising God. No matter what the situation is, because you are in the garment, you just keep praising God. I hope it's beginning to be clear the way this interdimensional and multidimensional thing works. All right? So I say all of that to say this, because when we read just now, wherein the Bible says, be careful or be anxious for nothing, God wants me to tell you that when he says for nothing, it includes nothing in any dimension. So not, don't just be anxious for nothing in your thoughts, be anxious for nothing in your subconscious. Because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The Bible says, let not such a man expect to receive anything from the Lord. Some of us have been able to quiet our conscious minds and we have been able to profess promises and we believe that, yes, I don't have to worry about anything. You're excited because you spoke to John and he encouraged you and you're jumping up and down. But the moment you are left up by yourself and the waters from your subconscious come to the surface, then you find that, oh my God, maybe I didn't think this thing through. If I have thought about it properly, I should be concerned. And that is because you are anxious for some things in some place. Praise God, we have time or we, or we don't. Oh, wow. At first, I thought it was like 8 o'clock. I was about to say that we have time because I want to explain certain things to us when it comes to knowing the reason why God says be anxious for nothing. 
You know, you see, this multidimensional thing that we're talking about, it is important because of the fact that it is usually the ones that you are least conscious of that come to bite you in the back. The Bible says it is the little foxes that spoil the vine. There is a dimension that is called the dimension of the past. There is a dimension that is called the dimension of the future. They are sub-dimensions of time. But the reason why we need to know how to be able to eliminate things from the past is because what was is what is, and what is is what will be. If you are still harboring anxiety in your past experiences with God, it will still bother you today. That is the reason why we need to learn how to deal with anxiety even from previous experiences because you knew that there were certain times that you felt like you were barely saved, that you were in so much trouble that if not for that one person that God sent, you were in trouble. You, you were barely saved, yes, by the mercy of God, but you haven't gone back there to resolve the anxiety that you left behind. What was is what is. And that is the reason why you need to be able to deal with it. So when the Bible says be anxious for nothing, you need to receive the tool that eliminates anxiety wherever it is found. So I say that because I want it to be brewing. I want it to fester in your spirit. And God willing, the next time we'll come here, we will pick up from there and tackle more the, the distribution of your powerful agents. You have agents in the realm of the spirit. They're like chemicals that bleach away stain from your thoughts. And there is a way you apply them such that not only are they bleaching the present, they're bleaching the past and making sure that there is no stain in the future. You are bleaching your consciousness, but you're also bleaching your subconsciousness. You're bleaching the dimension. In fact, there is an interesting dimension that I have been looking to of late, but I haven't really spoken to anybody about it. But I want to tell you about a dimension of words that you have not spoken. Let me tell you something. There is a dimension wherein the words that you have not spoken are and they're waiting. Because there is nothing made that was made that was made without the word. So if the word of God makes all things, then that means the things that have not yet been, the word of God has already made them because that word is now resting. It is done. The Bible says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. And so there are things in a future dimension that has to do with words that you haven't spoken and you can access that dimension now and begin to strengthen those words so that when the future comes and you say them, they will come with so much authority, you wouldn't have to repeat yourself. You know, when Jesus was at the tomb of Lazarus, he made a statement that went past me for so long. He said, Father, I thank you because you hear me always. You hear me in the past. You hear me in the present. You hear me in the future. You hear what I haven't even said. I, and, and I can guarantee you, you will find yourself in situations where you don't have time to pray all of what's in your heart. But you can leverage those words that have not been spoken from the present. Jesus says, I thank you because you hear me always. Do you know that Jesus delayed for, for how many days? For like two or so days. So by the time he journeyed back and forth, it was already four days since Lazarus had, had died. But Jesus was like, it doesn't matter if I had said this prayer just before he died. It doesn't matter. Because if I am saying it now and my father hears me always, he can receive my words as though it was said four days ago. So when this body comes out here, it's not going to be smelly. It's not going to decay. Uh, when Lazarus came forth from the dead, a body that had been dead for four days. They had been pouring oil and ointment on him just so that people passing by would not have to hold their breath. But when he came forth, Jesus was like, give him food. 
Feed him because he is almost as if he didn't die. Simply because he knows that the Father hears him always. Your words exist in multiple dimensions and you need to know how to access the right one to get the result that you need. Some of us have stigmas that surround our lives from past mistakes, our lives from past mistakes, and you don't even know how to get rid of them. Your Father hears you always. You can go back in time and fix it with a word. That is the reason why he makes all things beautiful in its time. So let me just quickly go over this thing. I don't want to say it another day. I want to give it to you right now. Prayer is of different forms. But there are three prayers that we just heard about, that we just read here, that are actually steps on your ladder to being at peace. And they are what? Prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. And this was what the Lord Jesus was saying to me when I knew that he came close to me just a couple of days ago. And he was saying it to me almost as if he knew that he needed to take his time so that I would get it. He said to me, the reason why you are begging God is because he answered your prayers. So let me say this to you. You have no business supplicating if you have not prayed. When God answers your prayers, sometimes is the reason why you now have to go into supplication because he has answered your prayer. The children of Israel prayed to God because the Bible says God said, now I remember my people and I have heard their cry. He heard their prayer for deliverance and that was the reason why he brought them out of Egypt. So coming out of Egypt was what? An answered prayer. But to survive on the way to the promised land, they needed supplication. They needed to beg for water. They needed to beg for food. Supplication simply means begging God. Coming to know that, look, I haven't done any work here. I don't merit anything. I'm just begging. Just give me food. But instead of supplicating, what did most of them do? They were complaining. You understand what I mean? So your prayer needs to be followed by supplication. You know why? Because supplication is one of the ways by which you acknowledge that what you're experiencing is from the hand of God, that it was God who answered your prayers. Because if God did not bring them out of the land of Egypt, who were they to attempt to be asking for water in the wilderness. They would have been under the foot of, they would have been under the feet of their slave masters, not deserving of anything, not even water. They can thirst and die there. It happened daily while they were in slavery. But to not be in the position, do you know how many times you have begged God for rent or for your mortgage? But that house, was that house not an answer to prayer? Did we not know? Or do you think we forgot how much you prayed for God to give you that house? And now that he's giving you that house and because situations are evolving for your growth, you can't afford the mortgage or the rent. And now you're begging God and say, God, please, just this one month. Next month, I know what I'm going to do. You see, supplication is called a humbled prayer because it repositions you at the foot of the cross so that you can always acknowledge that it is not by your power, nor by your mind, but by the Spirit of God. So I want to encourage you today that if you haven't prayed concerning a thing and you are not just going straight to supplication, you may be jumping the gun. Look at the things that you have prayed for, the things that you have asked God for, and then begin to make supplication concerning your experiences in the fulfillment of those things. So supplication is step number two and thanksgiving is step number two. Three. And why is Thanksgiving important? Thanksgiving is important because when we are making supplications because we are human beings, it makes us feel so little that we become vulnerable to pride. You feel so little that you become vulnerable to pride and you become resentful if you are not thankful. So even though I'm still 
supplicating and begging God to do certain things for me, I immediately switch to thanksgiving because if I don't, resentment will come in. Do you know what resentment looks like? Do you not care that I perish? Like the apostle said to Jesus, like, man, really, do we have to even beg you to save us? Are you not the savior? But if you immediately go to the next step, it will steady your soul, and that next step is thanksgiving. You know what they call that, or what I like to call that? I like to call that is winning with every step. You pray, you make supplications, and then you give thanks. And that is the way by which you maintain a peace, peaceable life, a life of peace, a peace that is beyond understanding. So the question on your mind might be, why is this word coming at this time? This word is coming at this time because of the fact that God wants to ensure that you do not abort any of the miracles that he is sending your way. Things are happening so quickly that you cannot afford any lapses. And that is the reason why we have to be completely shored with thanksgiving so that we do not leave room for resentment because if there seems to be any delay, sometimes our minds race to resent resentment. You resent God, even though you don't want to admit it, but your actions show that you're not happy with him. Sometimes our actions show that we question his resolve and his position on things. But the reality of it is if you would immediately go to Thanksgiving. I was speaking to my brother earlier today. Without even him knowing that I had made up my mind that I would share this which the Lord shared with me today. He said this to me. He said, do you know that five out of the six times in the Gospels where Jesus gave thanks, he gave thanks for things that had not yet happened. When Jesus took the bread, the little boy's lunch, when he lifted up to heaven, it was still five loaves and two fish. And it was like, I give you thanks. The Bible says he lifted it up and he gave thanks. It wasn't until after he gave thanks that they multiplied. Even the example of Lazarus that I gave about dimensions, he says, Father, I thank you because you hear me always. He always includes even the words that I haven't said. Even what has not happened, I'm giving you thanks for it. And so what does that tell you? What that tells you and I is that we cannot overthink God. Praise the Lord. We're going to read one more verse of scripture. We're going to break bread. But I want to tell you that, like I said to you, this is not theory. But if it's still theory to you, let me explain it as simply as I can. I described to us Oh, I reminded us today that we are multidimensional beings. Thank you, Kenyatta. That we exist in multiple dimensions at the same time, whether we're conscious of it or not. Some of those dimensions have to do with components of time, past, present, and future. Some of those dimensions have got to do with your own composition, spirit, soul, and body. Some of those have to do with your consciousness, your thoughts, conscious and subconscious. All of these many areas, you need to learn how to treat them as unique existences on their own so that you do not treat any one of them with levity because every single one of them is important, right? And that you need to be a transient figure, one that is able to traverse these many dimensions, doing what you must at every dimension for your peace so that you are complete, lacking nothing. But one thing that I didn't spell out to you particularly is how do you do that? How do you hop dimensions? I have hinted on so many things, but I am, I'm aware that I haven't particularly spelled things out and it's intentional because I don't want you to focus on the tool. I want you to understand the principles first. So I'm going to tell you that Thanksgiving is a tool for hopping dimensions. Praise the Lord. So when you give thanks to God for what he hasn't done, what you're doing is you're allowing yourself to come into this machine, this time machine that is called Thanksgiving that takes you to the future wherein you are in front of your benefactor receiving that which he promised, even though it has not yet happened. And as time goes on, in this season that we're in, as much as the Lord gives us grace, I'm going to share with you some of the, more, some of the other tools that I have come to learn in my walk with God that allows for me to hop dimensions. When Jesus told me earlier, tell them to find me, is because I found him where he was. 
as the worship was going on, I found him simply because I have learned certain ways to escape from one dimension to another. Like I told you, you are too valuable and sometimes too vulnerable to remain in this dimension 24 hours. What did I tell you last week? I said many people suffer depression because they're always in one dimension. It becomes overwhelming. You need a break. It's not just going to Belize that gives you a break. Not going on vacation. That, so, you see, your body can enjoy a vacation by you changing location, but your spirit needs to enjoy a break by you changing dimensions. I want you to try this. If you are tired and you're feeling weighed down for asking God for the same thing and begging him for the same thing, try giving thanks for the same thing. And suddenly your body feels light simply because you have changed dimensions. So I was here and I decided to just hop to another dimension while the worship was on. And that was where I saw him and he said, tell them to find me. And you know, I will, I will share this with you very quick and we're going to break bread. You see, we're going to read Isaiah chapter 17 today as we break bread. But let me tell you something. <laughs> we're also going to read Colossians chapter 1 verse 3. Oh yes, thank God for Christ. As soon as I saw him coming, I remembered. We're going to read Colossians chapter 1 verse 3. But you know one of the things that I've come to learn is this. You need to learn how to just leave where you're at to be where you want to be or where you need to be. Where I was, was I was at a place where I was paying attention to the sound of the music. I could, I could hear it, the notes, the, the voices, the harmony. That was where I was. And then I realized, I was like, wow, this thing is present, not just so that I can see it, but it is present so that I can use it. So I decided to use the singing as a springboard to get into another dimension. And the moment I did that, I found myself before the Lord and tears started running down my face because there is just no way you can be that close to the lover of your soul and not be completely overwhelmed with his love. And we need such experiences just to revive us. But if you don't practice, the Bible says we have our senses sharpened by reason of use. It wasn't the first time that you tried to use the navigation system in your car that it worked for you. You made the left turn a couple of times when you were supposed to make the right turn because what it was saying is not what you were seeing. But with time, now you know. You don't even have to look at it. You can just keep hearing the lady talk to you in 200 yards, turn left. Because right now you become familiar. I'm not talking about familiarity for contempt, but I'm talking about familiarity for exploit, wherein you become so confident in certain spaces you can navigate. So let's look at that, Isaiah 17, verse 19, very quickly, and then we'll link it to Colossians 1, 3 and break bread. Isaiah. And I've been wanting to read something other than Isaiah for breaking bread for some time. Isaiah and Jeremiah. So Isaiah 17, verse 19. Okay, one quick second. Sorry, verse 9. Isaiah 17, verse 9. Look at what it says. The Bible says, In that day his strong cities will be forsaken, will be a forsaken bow, and an uppermost branch, which they left because, the, because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. They left it because of what? The children of Israel. A time is coming. What did I tell you at the beginning? I told you at the beginning that you need to recognize who you are in Christ Jesus, begin to claim victory as an overcomer, such that the enemy does not bother with you tomorrow because you are a waste of time. Because of you, let them desert the future. Let them desert their strong city. Let them vacate the place because they're like, why do we want to remain in this place and occupy a promise that God has made to his children, the ones who know how to claim the promise? Because when, he come, when they come, they will come with their Lord. You see, the enemy can flee before you get there. You see, some of the things that are troubling us today, some of the habits that we're trying to shake today, they cannot stand in the face of who you are going to be tomorrow. 
Some of the habits that you're trying to kick today, the reason why you're struggling with them was because you did not overcome them when you were 16. And that is the reason why they can still bother you today. But what if that addiction can see what you would look like at 48? So if that future me is void of that addiction, then why am I struggling with it today? Is my Lord not the same yesterday, today, and forever? Am I not like him? I don't have to wait for the passage of time because there is the dimension wherein I can move time. And if time doesn't want to move, I jump time. The Bible says the strong cities have been forsaken and an uppermost branch which they left because of the children of Israel and they will be there. So let them leave because of you, because of who you are going to become. If who you are today is not enough to intimidate the lack of ideas, that is not, if it's not enough to intimidate the poverty and the lack or the mismanagement, then be your future self that has already attained the experience, the knowledge, and the understanding. Because there is no time to waste. We need to learn how to jump. Now let me show you Colossians chapter 1 verse 3. The Bible says, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Let's read this again. The Bible says, we give thanks to God, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Folks, if you know that a time is coming wherein the limitations that suck you dry today will no longer be able to come close to you because the Lord would have lifted you high. If you truly believe that a time is coming Wherein, when the enemy sees you from afar, they will not even attempt to see how you're going to react because they have already seen Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you know that that time is coming, why don't you begin to give God thanks for that future stature of you today? <laughs> give God thanks. And Paul says, Praying for you always. Now that is the part that I really want to focus on as we break bread. So if I am praying for you always, I want to simplify what it means, always. I already mentioned it, but I'm going to say it again. Always is yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Always is past, present, and future. And so if he's saying, you just focus on giving thanks because you have been prayed for. So what that means is all of prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving can happen at any time of your choosing. You prayed yesterday, you're making supplications today. And when you finally receive that which you have prayed for, what do you do? You give thanks. Most of us are not giving thanks today because we have not received. You understand what I'm saying? But the Bible says you can choose to go and wait at the finish line, which is where thanksgiving is. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. I am going to give thanks in the future because I would have received. So what I'm doing by giving thanks always is just staying at the finish line so all of this rumbling of the past and the present does not bother me because I've already gotten to the end. It's a simple principle, but you can work it. And that's why Paul says, you just focus on giving thanks. Because the Bible says Jesus makes intercessions for you always. So all of what you need to take care of in your past, all of what you need to, be, to have taken care of in your future, Jesus says, I've got this. Find me, find peace. 
find me, receive what I have for you. And how do you find him? Because even if you have found him, you can't come to the place that he's in unless the courts are open to you. And you can only access that portal through thanksgiving. So I want to encourage you today, regardless of what you're going through, as we break bread, I want you to say, I receive the grace to time travel so that my thanksgiving is genuine. So that when I'm giving God thanks, I'm not just giving God thanks in pretense. That I am able to give God thanks because I have heard the sound of my joy. I am able to give God thanks because I have received the fullness of my supplication. I am able to give God thanks genuinely because I am not just imagining, but I have actually been to that place wherein I have received. And let me tell you something. God can take you there and he wants to take you there if you would seek the Lord. Jesus says, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. I want you to use this exercise, this ritual that the Lord Jesus himself instituted. I want you to use it as a way of engaging his grace today to take you to the place wherein all things have been settled concerning you so that you are without any worry, you are without any concern, but you're just full of praise to the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to receive the body of Jesus today and his blood in remembrance of him, saying, Lord, I receive that grace. I will give thanks. I will give thanks from the finish line. I will give thanks as one who has fully received I will give thanks as one who is standing tall. I will give thanks as one who has overcome because that is who I am in Christ Jesus. I want to encourage you with this last scripture and then we're just going to wrap up the service. Is there anyone here that knows how to work that system? Because I think it stopped the, the sound from playing. So if you could just do that. So that we don't miss Alan too much today, that'd be awesome. I'm going to encourage you with this scripture. It's a sermon on its own, but I'm trusting the Lord that you would make use of the help that you already have in the Holy Spirit. Alrighty. So look at what the Bible says in um, Romans chapter nine verse eight. Romans chapter nine verse eight. The Bible says, "For He will finish the work." and cut it short in righteousness because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. I say that because somebody, as I was wrapping up and I'm about to put the bread in my mouth, I felt resistance coming from someone who doesn't particularly believe that it is possible to move time and to jump time because the Bible says Line must be upon line and precept must be upon precept. You, you think what I'm saying might be too fantastical because of the fact that it doesn't even make any sense. Why would God give us the grace to be able to jump and hop if he makes one day to come after another day? Here is it. Here it is in the word of God wherein it is said that the Lord himself is doing what is cutting time short giving you the ability to be able to leap over gaps in the chronology of events. And so if that, if that was you, I want you to just receive this scripture and meditate upon it. Let it bless your heart so that you do not deprive yourself of the great and marvelous things that God wants to do in your life. I say that to you today in the mighty name of Jesus because I know that sometimes the Bible, not sometimes the Bible says that knowledge puffs up. Maybe you have knowledge in the area of the continuum or how time works by the ones who say they know atomic physics and you're like, oh, maybe this thing doesn't really work. Let me tell you something. Do not limit yourself by limiting your God. If he says that is the way that I operate, that is the way that I have designed you to operate, just let him lead you. Lean not on your own understanding. 
the peace that he promises you in Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 is a peace that is beyond understanding. Your understanding can be saying one thing, but if you can align yourself by faith with the love of your heavenly father, all things are possible. You can wait at the finish line to see yourself cross that line victorious. You can. That was what Paul did. He waited for himself at the finish line. And he was commending himself as he was crossing the line. He said, look at me. I have run the race. Because he was already seated with Christ Jesus. And that's what makes it easy. Imagine if someone sends you back now to do fourth grade math. It's going to be like a walk in the pack because it's so behind you. Although you may have to be reminded of certain things. But the reality of it is you are, you are bigger than that problem now. And so give yourself an opportunity to leverage your future self. I say this to you and I've said it to you before once. And the reason why it's coming forth again is because the Lord knows that we haven't used it as judiciously as we should. So this time around, let's make a difference. Let's summon our future selves and, and, and begin to leverage that glory of Christ Jesus. I just have so much joy bubbling in my heart right now. And I just know that people are walking away from limitation into liberty. I have joy in my heart because this is my desire of the Lord that we all will, 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 will seize the opportunity by the wisdom of God to, to hop dimensions and be free and be truly joyful and not be weighed down by something that is going on intensely in one realm. Because sometimes in your body, in this realm, you may be tired. Don't let it just weigh you down all day, every day. Go to a place wherein there is no worry. Go to a place wherein those things are not the same. And from there, exercise confidence in God and power in his grace. I'm going to pray for four people tonight very quickly. You see, this scripture from Matthew chapter 7 verse 12, it keeps coming to my mind. And after this one, we're going to break bread and I'm going to pray for the three other people. Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. You see, I, I, I can almost call you out, but um, I choose not to do that today, but we're just going to read Matthew chapter 7 verse 12 and, and quickly pray for the other three people so that we can finish. And this, what I'm about to read to you, the way it was revealed to me, is that there is a lid, more like a, a cover, or like a top, on the bottle of your joy and it's been undone so that it can overflow. And so if you are the one that this scripture is for, this is the experience that you're gonna have. You will feel bottled joy now overflowing because God wants you to rejoice in what he has already done for you that you may not have received or be, be, become aware of in the natural. Matthew chapter seven, verse 12. Look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, therefore, what so, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. I want you to know that you, are, you have identified certain people that can help you and you're looking forward to seeing them make a move. Let them do what they're supposed to do. Let them do what they're supposed to do. And the Lord is saying that you, whatever you want them to do to you, do unto others. As challenged as you might be in this very moment, God says there is something that you can do for somebody. As challenged as you might be, as pressed as you might be, you can be the joy to somebody. And that is what opens the bottle of your own joy to let it overflow. So I pray for you right now in the mighty name of Jesus, you woman of God, that you will find that insight by God to go to the person that you are already a blessing to or able to be a blessing to at this time and be their joy. And those who are supposed to be your joy will no longer be able to delay because you would have closed the gap in time. So just go ahead and do it. The Lord is going to lead you. Yes, you're already thinking about it now. Yes, the Lord says you go ahead and be their joy. And the ones that the Lord has sent to be your joy that you have already identified in the place of prayer and revelation, that we have no choice but to come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. So let us eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. The three other people that I want to pray for, 
I'm going to pray for you from Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, and Gen I mean, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, verse 2, and verse 3. And I want you to listen very quickly. Um, um, I'm going to pray for you because I know that you're getting close and there are certain things that you have desired concerning the father of your child. And so you're one of the, you're, you're my second category of people. Okay, so just, but I'm telling you, keep your eyes open, keep your heart open. As the word comes forth, I want you to grasp it by faith because it's going to do you good and it's going to allow for you to show another the way. So now, Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 1 that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right? God created the heavens and the earth. So I'm going to pray for you in this category. Heavens represent where your blessings are currently. The earth represents where you want them to be. But God was the one who created them both. So God, your heavenly father, is the link between the two of them. So I pray for you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, that you will learn how to be with him and not hurry from him to go execute your own plans. He is your help. You are not his help. So I pray for you that from this moment onwards, you will learn to retire yourself from trying to help God and just let God be God because he was the one who created the source and the destination. So this is a prayer that I'm saying for you because you have tried on your own and you have failed because every now and again you keep seizing the reins from God because you have not truly fully let go. So today receive the grace to let the creator of the source and the destination to be God and to be in charge. And I want you to put your, heart, your hand on your chest and say, I receive peace into my heart and I allow myself to come into the rest of my maker. Now, Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2? And this is where I want you to read along with me. It says, the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. You see, what I am seeing is there are people around you and there is darkness on their face. They can't see what is before them. They can't see what the Lord has placed around them. They just can't see because darkness is on the face. The Bible says darkness was on the face of the deep. There are certain people who are, win, who, who are in our lives and they just cannot see. And the Bible says God spoke. And what did he say? In verse 3, it says, let there be light. Now this is the part of the prayer that breaks into two. That's why we have two and three, all right? The first part is God would allow for you to see the darkness. And then he would allow for you to be the light. God says, let there be light. That was then. But now there is already light because you are that light. Jesus says, as I am, so are you. And he said to you, you are the light of the world. And so now that you know that you are the light of the world, allow yourself to shine. Just allow yourself to shine. And what have I taught you about shining? Arise, shine. For you to shine, you just have to stand up. Stand up. Don't allow yourself to take a back seat when it comes to the salvation and the deliverance of other people. Stand up, be on your feet, and let God move you. Now, these other Pray, I'm going to break into two because um, this is something that has been brewing in my spirit for a little bit. I would say maybe from the weekend. And I'm just going to say it very quickly. I know that there are parents here and there is a lot of light in you, but you just can't figure out how to get the light into your children. So I'm going to say this, Lord, show me where to stand. In conversation, show me where to stand. You know, I touched on this last week. Um, I don't mean to take too much of your time, but I wasn't here on Saturday, so I'm kind of just making up for lost time in a way. Please bear with me. But on Tuesday last week, I did say to us that it is significant for you to let God position you. God was the one that positioned Moses on the mountain for Moses to see the glory of God. Many of us, we have been positioning ourselves and our children are seeing us as stumbling blocks, as opposition, as obstruction. You're butting heads, and that's because you positioned yourself. Tell God now, Lord, position me because I am your lamp. 
The Bible says that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord with which he searches the inward parts of the belly. Lord, if I am your candle, if I am your lamp, my candle doesn't position itself. I position it where I need it to be. Lord, position me in the lives of my children. Position me in the life of my spouse. Position me in the life of my business partners so that they can finally see the light. And lastly, even though I said we're going to stop at verse 3, but verse 4 is calling at me. And the Bible says, and God saw the light. I prayed for you and I said that you will see the darkness so that you can be the light. But I also pray for you that you will see the light. And that you will see that which is good in the light. So that no resentment of the darkness will remain in you. So that when you see that light, it allows for you to let go of every past mistake, every past offense, and every past shortcoming, so that none of that will hold. So the people standing in front of you after this work of deliverance has taken place will be completely whole, not just to God, but to you, so that you can enjoy the fullness of what God has put on the inside of them. I pray that for you specifically, and I come back on this side because there is a mother on this side whose children need to see that light. And I pray for you that even you will be able to see the light by the time this work is done, so that you do not continue to expect it to happen after it has happened. Because the Lord himself has said he has cut it short. You already know who you are, so just receive this word. See yourself in the dimension wherein the word of God is bread. Wherein it is tangible. Wherein you can hold it. There was a man of God in scripture. He went into a dimension by heaven's invitation wherein the word of God was a book, a physical book that you can eat. And he ate the word of God and everything changed. Can you eat the word in this dimension? No, you can only hear it. But God took him to a place where, so I said to you, look, please look at me, woman of God, look at me right now. The word of God is bread to you this moment. Seize it and eat it. Because the moment that word becomes bread and you eat it, you will see the light in those children. And everything has to say will become glory and honor to the praise of God's name. In the mighty name of Jesus. Communion house, I have one more declaration over you today. I'm glad that we have broken bread. But I don't believe I should step down until we have looked into this together. Come with me to Exodus chapter 19. We will just quickly touch on this Exodus chapter 19 because what it is, it is a stepping stool to allow for you to reach things that are yours that have been put away because you were not mature enough to handle them. They were not hidden from you. They were saved up for you. Exodus, what did I say again? Okay, so that means we're still awake, praise God. Exodus chapter 19. And, um, Sister Nancy, I want you to run around this, not now, when the meeting is over, before you leave today. Just maybe walk very quickly, but preferably just run around this place, because I see you just with so much excitement and joy that you just wouldn't stop running around in this place. And I want you to tap into that by doing that in this, in this physical space as a way of connecting to when it will happen that which you have petitioned of the Lord. You see, it is time. Yeah, it is time. It is time. It is time for her to progress to that next level. It is time for her to go to that next place. And it will happen in such a way that it is going to be beautiful. Everything about it is going to be amazing. So you, you were giving God thanks for that. You were celebrating, rejoicing. I want you to just do that just as a way of saying, you know what? Even from this dimension, I am hopping into the next. I'm creating a resonance of my miracle in the mighty name of Jesus. Exodus chapter 19. We're just going to read very quickly. Praise the Lord. God is good. I am looking forward to when we're going to have more than two meetings a week because my heart is overflowing with, uh, with things. And I'm like, how will these things be? You see, because it's like, there's just so much. And I don't want to be rushing every time. And I know that there are so many people that God is loading up with things that need to have an avenue, an opportunity to offload on us. So let us all connect by grace, I mean by faith, to that grace to make it happen very expeditiously so that we can begin to do one and one meeting or two meetings a week. So Exodus 19. Look at what it says in verse 1 and 3. We're just going to jump over 2 because of time. It says, In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt on the same day when they came to the wilderness of Sinai, 
And Moses went up to God, and the Lord God called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. I want you to assign yourself a position. Assign yourself the position of a messenger of good tidings. I beg of you, heaven is looking for courier. Heaven is looking for people that will be like Moses, that will go up to the mountain when other people are still so focused on going far away from Egypt. Many people are so obsessed with just getting away from their problems that they're not even seeing what God is saying. God is like, okay, maybe we don't have to bring everybody to the mountain, but he's looking for courier. He's looking for people that would allow for themselves to be the one to bring the mind of God, to bring the things of the kingdom that is not all problem, problem, I'm trying to get away from this, get away from that. Does it make sense to you? When they had come out and gotten to Sinai, what is the significance of Sinai? Sinai was the place that God promised Abraham that he wanted to meet with his children. Bringing them out of Egypt was not just to deliver them from problems. It was to bring them to a place of encounter. But they were still so focused on just getting away from Egypt. And God is like, I am looking for courier. I'm looking for people that will bring encounters to others. You see, when the Lord said that to me, I'm like, Lord, here I am, send me. He says, you are doing your beat. He said, but we need more people. And that is the reason why I just didn't feel right to step down from here today without letting you know that you can apply. Heaven is looking for people. God bless you. We're going to take up the offering in a moment. I'm just going to ask Antoine to just come and pray over the offering. But I want to encourage you. We're so close to something. You don't want to miss out of it. Stay in faith. Stay prayed up. God bless you. Dear Heavenly Father, <clears throat> thank you for allowing us to present offerings to you. Help us to understand that these offerings um, are our testament and our uh, commitment to you, dear Heavenly Father, that we are a part of your kingdom, um, that we recognize your glory, and that we recognize that you are the source of everything that comes through our hands. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that everybody <clears throat> submits their offerings in the way that you tell them to. In Jesus' name, in his glorious name. Amen.